this morning. Great singing. Um, I wish I once heard someone say, I can't remember who it was, but you know, it was a pastor who said that one way to know uh, if a church is moving in the right direction is if men are being raised up to preach the word of God. Amen. And I think, well, it always stuck with me, and that's something that's dear to my heart is that we're raising up preachers and missionaries and Plant churches, you know, all in the vision of what we want to do here. And so, in order to do that, you know, you have to sometimes share the pulpit. And so that's what I'm going to be doing this morning. Um, Tim McLaughlin, and it's funny because he he wrote, here's the syllables, he broke down his name for me. So, <laughs> to uh, McLaughlin, did I say it right? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not, that's not a joke. Tim McLaughlin. So if you were if you were here last Sunday, uh, there was a pastor sitting right in the middle there, Pastor Robert, and I told him how much uh, how dear he is to me. Uh, when I went to his church, I gave out a call for some people to come help us plant the Haven Church, and Tim McLaughlin and Carol and were, were one of the families who came out with us, and he has uh, been a big help. But um, we, we we I knew that he was um, one of those people who were going to eventually go out and plant a church or eventually want to be a, a pastor, and so I'm just grateful that he has come. He's been with me for a while, but uh, more in the pastoral intern type of type of place where he's learning ministry and also teaching and, and this and that. And so he's been really great. I want to give you a little background on him. Uh, he right now is uh, in Bible College at North e North Northeastern Baptist College in Vermont. Um, obviously, he was part of the Haven team, and that degree that you're working on is just pastoral ministry with a minor. Yeah, did you guys hear that? So pastoral ministry, pastoral ministries with a minor in church ministry, church planning. So uh, he's learning all about church planning. He got, he got to see everything that happened at the Haven. He's very active in that as well. And he's also here. He has plans to actually go plant and get this Ireland. All right. Now, that would explain the kill people at some uh, church once. <laughs> I know it's funny when I tell some people who are, that you were, uh, were preaching today, they're like, Oh, the kilt guy. <laughs> that's pretty funny. But, um, yeah, so he's going to be going. That's that's the plan, but you know, God shapes our plans. We don't know what he's going to be doing, but we know that he loves the Lord and loves to preach. And so I'm excited for him to be here. He also has a, a blog, if you're interested in that type of thing, a blog or online, a theology blog, so we can get with him and, and find out. I think he posts to that thing pretty regularly. So you can, I've read some of it, some really good stuff. So. Just thankful to uh, have other men who are stepping up to, to preach and teach. And so um, let's just give him a warm welcome. Amen. Take a look. Tim, Pastor Tim is part of a series on Colossians, 
Um, he's, you know, the first two chapters, he did this thing, Jesus over everything, kind of looking at big pictures in the first two chapters. Now he's in the latter two chapters, which are very practical, and so he's doing this a lot. He's talking about, like, walking this Christian life out, walking with Christ. And so, since we're talking about that, I wanted to go ahead and have uh, something where we look at a snapshot of that, right, somewhere else in Scripture. Because if we want to be living the life that we're created for, we need to occasionally ask ourselves what that life is. You know, we need to ask ourselves, what are we here for? And the Bible tells us that that, was, that we were made to be in relationship with God. So, big point, everything else that I say today is going to come back to this, but mankind was created to be in a relationship with God. That is the point. That is what the Christian life looks like ultimately. It looks like walking with Him. But we're going to be breaking that down a bit more. Um, because, you know, then you have questions like, how does that affect me? What does that look like? Does it look like church attendance? Does it look like keeping rules? If we go outside and ask people who aren't in church, what does that look like? What do they see? What do they think of when they think of the Christians that they know and, and just, you know, the Christians that are on TV and all this other stuff? What does the Christian life look like? They're probably going to say things like voting history or boycotting certain brands or eating at Chick-fil-A or, um, I'm <laughs> So we want to we want to look at one of the places in Scripture where we get some of those answers. We're going to be in the book of Jude, where we're starting on verse twenty. Now this is while you're flipping to that, it's easy to miss. It's, the whole book is one page, um, but it's right before Revelation, so it's right at the end. So because it's such a short book, and because we're not exactly doing a series on Jude, I'm going to briefly kind of summarize what happens in Jude to get us to verse twenty before we read verse twenty. While you're flipping there. So, Jude, you know, he's, he's apparently one of the uh, brothers of Jesus. He wants to write to these people about our common salvation, he says at the beginning. But they have a problem. They have the problem that there are these false teachers coming in, causing problems in the church, and leading people astray. And so, instead, he says, listen, we need to address this right now. We need to talk about how to identify false teachers and people who are going to cause problems among you. Because they've lost sight of Christ. And so he goes ahead and he starts to describe them. Um, so he kind of starts and ends with that in verse 4. He calls them certain persons that have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out with, for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. And deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And following that near the end of his slow description in verse 16. He calls them grumblers finding fault. Following after their own lusts, they speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Now, in between, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in Jude. Um, comes up in conversation every time I mention Jude. Stuff like, you know, why do we have the devil and Michael fighting over the body of Moses? The point of all of that is that he's doing imagery that his readers would have understood that helped them understand how to recognize these false teachers. Things that they are saying, things that they are doing, how their lives look. And how this is ultimately going to work out for them, which is not well. And what we do know about the false teachers from Jude, we can kind of summarize that as being they're divisive, they're prideful, and they've rejected authority, including the authority of Scripture. In verse 17, he then starts to shift gears with this but you statement, where he tells them, remember what you've been told. You, remember what you've been told by the apostles that these people are going to come. He then describes them a little bit more. And then he gets to verse 20, where we're going to start today. Verse 20 is a 180. It's a sharp contrast from the rest of the book. He's saying, but you. This is what they have been. This is what these false teachers have been. This is what these uh, people who are coming in without the Spirit have been. But you, those of you, of you who have Christ, this is what you should look like. This is what your life should be. So I'm going to be referencing some of the contrasts that happen throughout the book um, so that you see why he's saying these things. Um, but since the book is so short... Um, I'm not going to be putting those verses up on the screen. You'll just be able to see them on the page there. So starting in verse 20, I'll go ahead and read from the NASB. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. So we have kind of three broad categories that we're going to take from this. It's going to be two verses each. Uh, the first of these is that the Christian life is a life of growth. Right? And we've been talking about this already a little bit in our culture, right? You see this on t-shirts and on Facebook and everything. This kind of mantra lately that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And to be fair, Christianity is also a religion. But there's a reason that we've been talking about this. There's a reason that we go into this. It's because we need to be reminded that it is fundamentally built on a relationship. Our entire religion is the living out of a relationship with God. So we need to come back to this. We need to be reminded of this sometimes. The reason that it was such a push when it came up a few years ago is that a lot of the culture had lost sight of that. And so we, we, we want to be reminded of that. He's going to be talking about that in verses 20 to 21. Because like all healthy relationships, it has to grow. Our relationship with God has to grow. Right? Like my relationship with my wife. Right? We were married back in 2011. That slide didn't come out right. We'll live. Um, but this was, this was a great day for, for us in a lot of respects, right? We talked about this. We have the, we have the much better uh, you know, pictures of them online and everything. But the thing that we need to remember, and I think most of us who are married will, will recall, is that this was not the high point of our marriage. All right? They, this was the beginning. They, relationships need to grow over time. Could you imagine if eight years after this picture, our relationship looked exactly the same as it did then? If we only knew each other as well as we did then? If our relationship hadn't grown at all? Because that wouldn't be a healthy marriage. And some of the ways that these relationships change over time is like in the area of like communication, where we, we're talking to each other, we're growing in our understanding of one another, we're talking about deeper things, we're talking more frequently. Um, our love for one another grows over time, right? That it's going to be deeper, more, more mature. And the decisions that we make, everything I do nowadays has to apply to how is this going to affect Carol? How is this going to affect our relationship? How is this going to affect our kids? I've had to grow to learn how to make decisions with that in mind. And so Jude begins his description here in verse 20. He says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. He is, again, describing growth here. And there's a lot happening in these two verses, right? And so a, a large part of our sermon is going to be this point. But... So he's talking four things he says here. All right, first is building ourselves up, all right, which is a direct contrast to verse 19, which comes right before it, where he says that these are the ones who cause divisions. They are worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Because where the follower of God builds, as God is a creator, the false teachers that they were dealing with were tearing down. Where the follower fixes their eyes on God, the false teacher fixes their eyes on the world. And where the follower lives by the Spirit, as Jude describes it, <coughs> The false teacher lacks the spirit. All right, so this is the contrast. So if we're being built up, we have to ask, what is it that we're building, being built into? And we actually have to go somewhere else for this one. This is 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. says, And coming to him as, a, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by man, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. All right, so what are we being built up into? Well, we're being built up into a spiritual house. This means that God is dwelling in us. He's dwelling among us. He's dwelling with us, all right? And so we have to be a people that are that our place where God can dwell, all right? A holy priesthood. A priesthood is a big deal, all right? The priest serves as a representative. All right? The priest goes before God and represents mankind to God, and goes before the people and represents God to the people. And so we have to be a people that are learning how to do that, that are, that are actually knowing how to represent God. What is this, who is this God that we're representing? And the spiritual sacrifice is laying ourselves down in service to Christ, as Paul says in Romans 12, 1 through 2. Where he, where he urges, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he warns them not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of the mind to the image of Christ. 
So how are we being built up according to Jude? All right. The other three things he says in these two passages. Prayer. All right. Remember that a healthy brain relationship requires communication. And so there has to be some means of communication between us and God for this relationship to be growing. This is a fundamental part of our relationship, and prayer is a fundamental part of our communication, right? God's word was given to us in writing, but we don't have a book to give him. We talk to him through prayer, and he often talks to us back through it. All right? Praying in the Holy Spirit, though, means praying with reliance on God. It's not just sitting there and talking and saying things on our own strength and assuming that God is going to hear it and it's going to work, that it's all going to happen. You know, we, uh, it's tempting all the time just kind of be like, oh, well, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and call things no. into, into being. You know, I see this a lot online. I'm claiming that. That is happening. No, you're not. You can't do that. I'm sorry. If you're not relying on the Spirit, if you're not going to Him and drawing from Him both the strength to pray and the content of your prayer, it's not going to do any good. It's not going to help in your communication with God. All right. Paul had some words on this as well in Romans, where he tells us in chapter 8 that in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Because, as Jesus told us, God isn't impressed with clever words. All right? It isn't enough to know the stuff. It's, do we know Him? And are we really allowing ourselves to be known by Him? God isn't interested in ritualistic formulas. There isn't a set prayer that's going to do the thing you want to do. We have to be raw with God. We have to be real with Him. We have to be honest with Him. He knows the truth anyway. He knows when we're not being those things. We have to trust Him to make it make sense. Right? When Hannah was praying at the beginning of 1 Samuel, when she's praying for a son, what is she doing? We don't have a rote prayer written down. We have her crying out to God, mostly by literally crying. And God answers that prayer. She's trusting Him to make this make sense. She's just pouring out her heart, and this is what we need to be doing. And then we have to trust Him to actually use it, to do something with it, to do specifically what He wants to do with it. Keeping in the love of God is, the other, is another thing that Jude talks about here. Uh, this is one of the defining traits that Jesus gave to the church from the beginning, is love. Right? He tells us in John, um, kind of in the, one of the last conversations He has with His apostles, He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so this is, this is part of the DNA of the church and has been from the whole beginning. This whole thing is built on love. This whole relationship, this is a loving relationship. Right? We're never called to follow Christ out of dutiful obligation. Right? We can't, we can't lose sight of this importance of, the, of God's love in this. Right? We are, we are called, you know, Paul calls himself uh, a bond slave of Christ, but constantly he reminds people, you have been adopted as sons. You were not brought in just to, to be brought in and do work and, and focus and be like, okay, well, I have to do this thing because God's my boss. No, you are brought in as children. You are adopted. All right? It, it's God's love that saves us. It's our response to that love that shapes how we grow. In fact, we, we have to ask ourselves, if we're, if we're living out the love of God, not only is it, um, do we love not only God, but do we love who God loves? If we're, loving, if we're living out the love that God has for us, then that love must overflow to the people that God also has love for. Do we reflect the love poured out on us to the world? Do we show that grace? Do we live that out? Do we act that out? Do we showcase that? And finally, he says, waiting anxiously. Now, this, this doesn't mean to worry, you know. Um, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul explains, to don't, don't let this mean that you'll be troubled by this. Just, we live in a period of anticipation, is what he's talking about here. That we know that there is something coming. We know that Christ is returning. We know that he's going to make all things new when he does. And so, right now, we live looking forward to that. 
We live thinking in terms of where we're going. Everything we do now should reflect that belief, right? There's this sense of urgency to what we do. And this comes up a lot in evangelism, but it should come up in everything else. Not only is it very, very important that we get out there and tell as many people as possible who this Christ is and invite them to respond to Him as quickly as possible because we don't know when He's coming back. But also, we only have so much time to read this Word, to understand this Christ before we stand face to face with Him, to sing these songs with these tongues that we, we have right now. There is an urgency to everything that we do because we know that He's coming, that this is a thing that is happening and we don't know when. All right? We should be living by faith because we know that this is coming. We know that Christ is making all things new. And so if we know that He's making all things new, then we can trust that these things are going to work out in some way. We are the beginning of this process of new creation. Right? That He's renewing us first and He's going to renew the created order next. If we know that the world around us is also going to be restored, are we treating it as something that's going to be with us in eternity? The truth of our salvation should inform our whole lives. Everything that we do, every person we interact with, everything that we interact with, should be influenced by this understanding that this story doesn't end here, that there is a major change that will happen before the next phase of it. And a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about here will come naturally if we're going to God and spending time in His Word. The more we go to God in spirit and truth, the more of a habit it will be to keep doing it. The more we pray, read and think about these things, the easier it's going to be to keep praying and reading and thinking about these things. And also God's Word challenges us to see and live out the love that He's poured out to us. And so the more time we spend in that Word, the more we're going to be challenged to do that. God's Word reminds us constantly of the truth of our salvation and how we can trust that. So in our daily lives, as we're reading and we're getting these reminders that you know what? This, these things have happened. I have saved you. I have redeemed you. I am coming back. As we get those reminders on our daily lives, we can begin incorporating those into our daily lives. And God will grow us as we continue to do so. But knowing how to live out the love of God and knowing how our salvation affects our decisions relies on discernment. And that is why the Christian life is also a life of discernment. In the next two verses, Jude begins to describe this. Starting in verse 22, he says, and have, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So what in the world is he talking about here? Right? So remember, the book of Jude is about recognizing true teaching from false teaching, right? And so he spends a lot of his book on the lifestyle of the false teacher. And so what he's saying now, he wants his readers to understand what it looks like when one commits themselves to error. So here, he seems to be pointing out that sometimes someone is struggling with the thing and we need to have mercy on them, right? Not every son who says something that isn't entirely theologically correct is a false teacher or a heretic. Right? Sometimes we have people who... Uh, they're struggling with a doctrine, or they're having difficulty understanding a thing, and they're trying to work it out, and in the meantime, they're, not everything they're saying actually quite lines up. We need to have mercy on that person. Sometimes someone is just mistaken. They were given a bad teaching in the past, and they haven't had the chance to correct that yet, and we need to put, point them back to the truth, right? snatching them out of the fire. But sometimes, as we see in God's Word, as we see throughout Jude, someone is willfully rejecting Christ or causing division or glorifying themselves, and we must respond by turning them away. And all of this relies on a willingness and an ability to see what's really going on with them. Right? Because the Christian should be marked by an understanding of things as they really are. All right? We, in contrast to these false teachers, we know God. We know the God who knows all things. And so we should be the last person to fall for, to pe lead people to fall for lies. Right? Because as, as you described in verses 8 and 10, that these, the men he's talking about, by dreaming, they're defiling their flesh, they're rejecting authority, they're reviling angelic ma majesties, which are probably the Old Testament. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. He's talking about people that don't have the discernment to avoid corruption, they don't have the discernment to recognize valid authority. 
They don't have the discernment to understand things outside of their basic daily functioning. And this lack of discernment that they have is leading to their destruction. But we are not on a path to destruction if we know Christ, if our relationship is growing to Him. Why do they lack this? Because they're worldly minded, as we saw in the last point. As, first, as we're told in 1 Corinthians, that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> Jude anticipates that his readers have access to the very wisdom of God. Because we're not worldly minded, but we have the mind of Christ, as Paul said. Because Christians are in an intimate relationship with the God who created, sustains, and understands all things. We have His Spirit living in us. We can rely on Him. We can trust His judgment on all things. We can go to Him about things. We can seek His wisdom. James reminds us, if any of you lacks wisdom, just ask for it. If we're in communication with Him, He can direct our steps. We can go to Him. We can talk to Him. We can say, listen, I don't know where I'm supposed to go on this. I don't know what's happening with the situation. Listen, i got this guy in my life who's saying these things. I don't know how to read that. We can go to Him with that. We can go to His Word, and we can talk to Him. It doesn't always mean it'll be easy to hear from Him, right? I mean, I have myself historically been the kind of stubborn that they write parables about. So when God wanted to get my attention, He needed to be such Him. Even coming to Massachusetts was like that. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm not actually from New England. I, was, I grew up in PA. I was living there at the time. And my brother was in Boston. And he wanted to help. He wanted to plant a church. And he called me up and he asked me to come and help. And uh, he described his plan to me. And I said, that sounds like a terrible plan. No. No, no, no. And I, I still maintain that it kind of was a terrible plan. But he pressed. And I said, okay, fine. I'll pray about it. I'll go ahead and pray for wisdom. Because I had I had finally gotten a well-paying job. I was engaged. I was looking at an apartment. I was involved in this church. Things were finally starting to come together for me. I was like, I don't have any reason to leave PA. And so I prayed about it. I was like, yeah, God, if you if you actually want me to go to Boston, um, just let me know, I guess. And within about a month, I had lost that job. And I find my fiance had left me. And the apartment fell through, and I got kicked off the tech of that church. And so I was just in there, nothing left holding me back to the other. Fine! I guess I'm going to Boston. So I did. And I've, I've basically been up here ever since. Because I saw a direction from God, and I got it in one of the only ways that I would have listened. Right? He, he knew what it took to get my attention. Because God's not particularly secretive, right? We talk about it in, in such a way, you know, the culture especially, oh, well, his, you know, we don't really understand his ways. Well, there's a certain truth to that, but if we go to him, we're going to get the information that we need. We're not always going to get all the information that we want. We're not always going to get to see the really big picture. But he makes sure that we know what we need to know to walk with him, to follow him. If we'll listen. Even sometimes if we don't, although I, I recommend listening. <laughs> in all things we can rely on God's wisdom. Our lives should be marked by wisdom that comes from God. In fact, all of this, everything that we're talking about, ultimately comes from God. Because the Christian life is a life centered on God. That's our third point. So how do we pull all this off? Well, G 